Okay, so I figured because the the format discussion just doesn't seem to go away, I figured it'd be worth having a discussion about the pros and cons and of like 6v6, 5v5, open queue, roll queue, and try and come to some sort of balanced uh, understanding because often we, we sort of talk about it as a 6v6 was better or 5v5 is better, when realistically, what we're really trying to find out is what would you prefer and what would be maybe more fun for the vast majority of the player base. We'll start, we'll go like, we'll trace the kind of history of Overwatch and we'll kind of along the way discuss the problems but also the, the benefits that came with each of these formats. So I think I have a pretty good idea of what it used to be like. So I don't think I've got like this rose tinted memory or I've got like a traumatic memory where I like, oh, it was so bad and maybe it wasn't that bad. So we'll start with Open Queue because that was the first real format. I'm going to ignore for the purpose of the discussion. I'm ignoring that Overwatch ever had a role lock less or a hero lock less format when you could pick five Widowmakers or whatever. That I don't think ever counted. So the problems that 6v6 Open you had the first and biggest one was the distribution between the roles which is to say that there was never enough non-dps players forget about just tanks because we we often think of overwatch as having a tank problem and it does have a tank problem and most video games have a tank problem in that people don't want to play tank but we'll get into that more with the roll lock uh, section it wasn't just tank it was that in terms of the distribution of the number of players who wanted to play the different roles about half wanted to play dps so you're about to get at least three dps on average in each of your games it didn't always pan out that way occasionally you got players who you know were all tank players all support players of course that occasionally happened by and large you were seeing mostly dps players a couple support players usually i would say like one three two was probably the distribution of the player base one tank three dps players two support players if you were lucky so that was one problem is that someone in the lobby always felt obliged or bad that they were being forced to pick a tank or a support just because they had to to make the game work and this was the experience for the majority of the player base where i was a flex player so i loved it because i got to i was able to fill whatever was needed and again we'll get to talking about the good parts of this in the pros section in the pro in the benefits section but it should be pointed out a lot of people were very miserable because they wanted to pick let's say dps but they felt like oh fine i'll reluctantly go roadhog and then you start doing these like weird trading maneuvers where It'll be like, I'll go tank in the first round, but then you have to go tank on defense because I actually want to play Widow. Or like, swap, give me Widow. I'm such a better Widow. Like, give me the Widow. Like, you, you, you suck. Then comes the chaos slash balance. As you can maybe guess, this was very difficult to account for. Let's just talk from a normal player perspective. We'll get to the meta part in the lower section. For normal players... Remember, you had one rank for all your heroes. So every single hero came under one rank. Essentially, which I actually like, but essentially it means that all the game is measuring is your ability to win. It's not measuring your skill on tank or DPS or support. It's just like, can you win? Which comes with it its own considerations. Because if you are, let's say, a, a Mercy OTP or a Ryan OTP, and you get into a game with another Ryan OTP or Mercy OTP, you're in trouble. Now that still happens now, but it's much less likely to happen and is impossible to happen on tank, right? Like you're now skewing specifically for one role and you're only competing with one other person at max for that same hero, even if you are only playing that hero. Whereas in, in open queue, it was less likely, but there was possibilities when because your, your tank could be awful compared to your support, if a game requires you to be playing tank because though there is another tank in the lobby, you might just be GG'd out of it. Like, it might just be like, we just don't even have a tank player GG. Like, our best... Like, this is a GM lobby, but the best our tank could play would be gold level. So, it's over. So, it was, it was very chaotic. It was very hard to really say empirically what was good and what was bad because it wasn't really even a game. Back then, we weren't really even thinking about balancing it in the same way that we think of it now. It's hard to conceptualize. But this is like pre-Overwatch League. Like, Overwatch League started with, yeah, 6v6, open queue. So we wouldn't be thinking about like, oh, this two shuriken damage for Genji is like going to break him over the edge. It was like, how do we even get people to pick two tanks? That was that was the level of our thinking. And people back then thought that Genji countered Bastion because when Bastion shooting, you deflect in front of Bastion, all damage go back, you win. Like that was the level of gameplay back then. Like we were very rough. We barely understood the surface level of the game. People hadn't figured out back then that you could stop shooting. That there, an option was that Bastion could just stop shooting the deflect. It was not in our minds. I promise you this is how stupid we were. The idea of the game was a lot stripped back and more simple. Which is also the charm of it as we'll get into it in a moment. But then there was the meta element. Which is that the opposite was the problem. 
in the pro level and the highest levels, people abused the worst comps, right? Which is generally three tanks or more than one tank. Three tanks, three supports became goats. And so once people figured out, and honestly, very quickly, they figured out the stacking tanks was strong. You kind of just lost a lot to the stacking of tanks and the stacking of healing. Of course, there was large periods when 222 was, was the meta and people were playing like two tanks, two DPS, two supports. But if any role was suffering, it was usually the DPS and usually they were sacrificed in favor of having a tank or support, which you can already see is completely at odds to how the player base wanted to play. You have a player base that's majority DPS and an optimal way of playing the game that's majority tank and support. So after open queue, the devs introduced 222, aka roll lock or roll queue. There were multiple things they were trying to achieve with this. One, for those who don't know, again, the meta comp at the pro level became a thing called GOATS. GOATS was initially Moira, Lucio, Brig, and Ryan, Diva, Zarya. So initially this was called GOATS. It, and when everyone started running GOATS, the GOATS mirror became Lucio, Zen, Brig, Ryan, Zarya, Diva. And the devs could not figure out how to stop this being a thing without changing the format. At the pro level, Overwatch League played this comp for literally like 18 months straight. And there were so many controversies with teams trying to change, like trying to play something else and failing. So one example I'll give you is that the Houston Outlaws back then, my buddy Jake was still on the Outlaws back then. There was one really famous game where the Outlaws were their Sombra DPS heavy comp was considered pretty good actually. People were like, you guys are actually pretty good at it. You should play it. And I think it was, they were, I don't remember who they were playing, but they were playing some team that I think they was considered beatable. It was like one of the, they were, the Houston Outlaws were not doing too well at the time. So they were on the lower tier teams and they were playing a fellow lower tier team. And people were like, you can beat them. Just play your DPS heavy Sombra comp and you can win. They didn't, they played a Goat's Mirror and they lost. Like they, they played Goat's, enemy team played Goat's and they lost. And their fans laid into them. Their fans were like, what the fuck are you guys doing? Why didn't you play GOATS? Why, did you, why didn't you play your DPS uh, comp? Why did you play GOATS? And it was a pretty famous situation because the Houston Outlaw players, usually players don't react because it, it looks bad to yell at your own fans. But this was one situation where the players, understandably, were like, shut the fuck up. You guys don't know what you're talking about. The reason we don't play our DPS heavy comp is that it will not beat the majority of the enemy teams like in the Overwatch League. If we want to win, GOATS is the best comp. Therefore, the only valuable thing we can do with our time is to practice GOATS. Is to like grind try hard GOATS. And get, if we're better, if we get better at GOATS, we have a higher likelihood of winning. If we split our practice time between GOATS and this DPS comp, we'll just lose in both regards because we won't be practiced on either end. So that's how dominant GOATS was. The people were even afraid to try other things. Now, I will add one thing that there was the absolute last tournament before Rolock was introduced and we were told that Rolock was going to be introduced. I think it was the Shanghai Dragons who played a 2-2-2 comp with Farah Mercy and they actually won that tournament. So it is possible and the longer GOATS went on, people did begin to adapt. They did start to mix Sombra into the GOATS or Ana into the GOATS specifically as an anti-GOATS measure. So it's not... 100% that GOATS wouldn't, would have stayed forever because people might have figured it out eventually, but we'd given it like two years and people hadn't at that time perfectly broken it down. So the devs decided to switch to 222 for one A, one big reason. Uh, Amy says they couldn't just tell the teams they weren't allowed to play certain comps. Well, that's not really how do you facilitate that? This is essentially what they did, but how do you facilitate that in an honor system? Oh, guys, don't play three tanks, three supports. Oh, but are we allowed to play three different tanks with three different supports? Are we never allowed to play three tanks, three supports? Are we allowed to play three tanks and one DPS? Are we allowed to play three supports and one DPS? Like, you know, there's so many stipulations. So essentially, they did, They did. it is what they did. They said, you have to pick two, two, two. And this also, quote unquote, became because, as I said, in ladder, people just weren't playing tank and everyone was playing DPS. So this forced a normal, composition now we'll get to the benefits of roll queue in the in the pros section but the problems that roll queue brought queue times the biggest most prominent problem that will recur again and again and again and maybe forever in the history of watch the minute that you forcing that there should be two tanks 
of this SR and two DPS of this SR and two supports of this SR, you're gonna have Q times. Because previously, you just needed to pull 12 diamond players, right? Which is so much easier to do. Like imagine if anytime you're trying to build a lobby, you just need to pull 12 diamond players, easy. But now those 12 diamond players need to be four tanks, four DPS and four supports. And as I said, the distribution was so whack or so out of whack, Q times shot up, instantly shot up. Now to caveat, this was, a new, this was during a, a very low period of rush. The, the row Q period, Already by that time, the devs were not releasing too many heroes. They weren't balancing too often. The content had dried up and the devs were already starting to make the PVE. So people will say that Roll Queue never really got a fair chance because the devs never gave it a lot of life at the time and the player base was a lot lower at that time. So that's also another reason why Q times were so high. But even at the best of times, the problem would have remained that the distribution of the player base just wasn't there. And so rather than getting that problem manifested in the game, where you're having to flex around in the game, the problem was even before you get into the game at all. Now, the problem was, you can't even get into the game for without waiting for 10 to 15 minutes. And this leads to the next problem, priority passes. So another trip down memory lane that some of you have never experienced, and you will maybe laugh, maybe you'll be like, oh, that was a good idea, when I tell you what priority passes were if you don't know. Because the above problem existed, the developers introduced priority passes. A priority pass was that if you queued flex or the role with the least desire, it was literally always tank. Basically, if you queued tank. So if you queued the role with the least players, you would get a priority pass. The way they distributed was two for a loss and six for a win. And so what ended up happening is you can use the priority pass to queue on then support or DPS and you'll get a faster game because you've queued with a priority pass. And what ended up happening is you could not realistically queue a reasonable time without a priority pass on DPS or support, especially DPS. So DPS queue times became like 20 minutes. I'm not even exaggerating. This is even at like master. I mean, back then I was still GM, but even master was like 15 minute DPS queue time. Even diamond was like 10 minute DPS queue time. And it could get a lot worse. Like for the top 500 streamers, like your streamers that you love watching, you could be half an hour in a queue time. Like that was sometimes with and without priority. Like if you didn't have priority pass, good luck. And you, even with priority passes, sometimes it was still 15 minutes. And that was a normal occurrence for it to be like 15 minutes with a priority pass just to get a game as DPS. So we created a situation where you had to have a priority pass if you wanted to queue. And so what people would start to do is queue tank, but really not give a shit. They would queue tank and pick Roadhog, pick something that like they didn't care what was happening with the composition. And all they were like, whatever, I don't give a shit. Even if I lose, I get two priority passes. And if I sneak a win somehow, I'll get six. Back in 222, as you may have heard discussed in such discussions, the two tanks that you picked were super important. Like it was super deciding to the game. There was like two states of it, right? It's like either your tanks have synergy or they don't. If both sets of teams have tanks that don't have synergy, fine. And if both sets of teams have tanks that have synergy, fine. Fair game. But if you ever got in a situation where your team had tank synergy, and their team didn't have tank synergy. It was a free win. It was like you could be smurfing in that lobby and you'd probably still lose. Unless you were one of the tanks who were smurfing, right? Because tanks were pretty powerful in controlling the state of the fight. But it shows you that it still wasn't very fun because people weren't playing it. So they were powerful, but they weren't fun. For all the reasons that they still aren't considered fun, you are the person who has to eat all the crap. There's a lot of responsibility on you tactically to start the fights, disengage properly, take the right positions, use the right cooldowns at the right time. Whereas you could be a lot more flexible with where you're playing on DPS when you're timing your engages like it was a lot easier and support with two things to cover for you was a lot easier as well. So now imagine that you have, you know, one team running a monkey Zarya, the double bubble it was called or the dreaded double shield. And we'll get into this segues nicely into the, into the two tank uh, synergy problem. It was, you know, shits and giggles, daisies, everything is happy. But should you get the hog Zarya, it's over. Like you, the game is over from the loading screen. And that was a big problem. People forget how big a problem this was. But I was there. I was a content creator at the time. I remember how miserable people were. And that was one of the reasons why people stopped playing. On top of the lack of content, it was not fun to wait 15 minutes only to get into a game that was already lost because your team picked fucking Roadhog Wrecking Ball who are great solo queue tanks, right? Because they just sustain on their own, but do fuck all for their team. And there was like, I remember, in fact, I remember vividly when the discussion around 66 and 5v5 first started, when they first announced 5v5, I made a tweet that like popped off because I think it expressed a sentiment that correctly hit what was going on. 
everybody loved the idea of two tanks but nobody wanted to play the two tank like people were when, when they announced 5v5 people were like oh we're gonna lose the two tank synergy this is fucking awful everybody loved the idea of two tanks in front of them but nobody wanted to be those two tanks people will say that again it didn't get its fair chance and we'll get into in the pros section of roll queue but this was the reality i'll speak simply for the reality of what it was whether it could have been better we'll see isn't it not the same thing now you just have one tank and a one tank still one strong counter you you don't even get like again i think it's hard to describe to the people who didn't play it the scale of the problem was much worse like yes it sucks when your tank is getting countered now but you can still sort of make it work you can still like let's put it let's try and make a ratio out of it right let's say right now you play 10 games where your tank is hard countered and won't swap you can win maybe two three of them right like maybe two or three of them are winnable if you play well and that's not bad considering a lot of games are auto losses even anyways because maybe your supports are glue sniffers back then i it would be like zero to 0 0.5 of 10 games that you will win when your tanks are just trolling and they have the right tanks I, I cannot state enough how unwinnable it felt. It, and also remember that one other factor to, to bear in mind, this is back when 2CP existed. So 2CP was a mode that heavily required coordination. So if you got Hanamura or Volskaya and your, ta like your tanks again are like ball hog, you're never getting through the choke point. Because the minute you try to walk through the choke point, they have two tanks with double shield. They're going to halt you out of cover. And every time you try to run through the choke, you're just going to die. There's going to, something's going to slow you, catch you. And your tanks are laughing because they're like, ha, I'm ball, I roll around in the back. Ha, I'm hog, I vaped my way into the back. You as a support at DPS, you're never making it through, especially as support. You would never make it through. So these are nuances to consider that 2CP was a problem then. If we added roll queue now, 6v6, there would be a different, like it would be different. Maybe 222 in push feels better. Probably feels, probably feels better and i've added visual clutter in here because it was a problem in open queue too but it was a much more prominent problem because we were trying to care about the esports of the game and trying to appeal to a wider audience after our initial burst popularity for Norwatch one launched we really struggled to attract players and one of the reasons was the visual clutter so one thing i should mention and one reason the devs gave for why they went 5v5 it severely hinder hindered what kind of heroes they could make because they had to not they had to make tanks without a shield they couldn't make and even just mitigation abilities became hard to give tanks because think about let's say a sigma now right sigma in 222 i think most people say he feels like a really good 222 tank because he kind of does a lot for himself and he and he does a, a lot of different things well but in in 6v6 roll queue it was horrible because his shield now stacked upon another person's shield is just too much it's like it's not just doubly better it's exponentially better because he throws his shield out and this is what used to happen you like orisa shield the orisa shield is like 900 hp and it's on a timer of like i want to say at, at some point it went down to like six seconds but the thing is like let's say nine you shoot it shoot it shoot it and when she drops it the cooldown already is starting to go so she and you so you there's like a funny trick you could do where before like if you're setting up on 2cp or any map if you're defending you just look up in the sky and throw your orisa shield as the round's about to start It'll take like five seconds to come down. By the time it lands, your cooldown's at like three seconds. And so they walk in at the time that your shield just drops. And then they shoot it, shoot it, shoot it. In three seconds, you drop another one. And then when that breaks, the Sigma throws his shield. Now his shield is going to take a while to break. Then he grasps. Then the Orisa, by the time his grasp is done, the Orisa drops her next shield. And now you go again. So it wasn't that just... It's doubly good to have shields. It's infinitely better because the shields are like now if a sig has let's say 40% uptime on his shield It's now 100% uptime on shields in in the game. So this was a, a fundamental problem It's just a fundamental core problem to Overwatch. applies to open queue as well But I'll get into the in the pro section open queue. There's open queue also had more solutions Roll queue had less solutions. They'd work themselves into a corner How do you design a tank that doesn't add to that problem? How do you design a tank that doesn't also just like if I eat stuff, will it be obnoxious on top of a, Sig a Sigma or a Risa? Is there anything else you can think of? Let me know. I'm going to start designing the 5v5 problems. So Q times are still a problem in 5v5. And I put brackets less so because it's less than 6v6. One of the reasons we swapped to 5v5 was, hey, we never have enough tank players. Fuck it. Let's just take one out. Make it 5v5 instead of 6v6. So that did help. But it's still 
you know, depending on the meta state, right? Like when support was the dominant role, there was a long queue times with support. I saw them, I felt them because I was playing support that season. Now instead of 10 minutes, queue time six is big. Yeah, exactly. So now instead of 10 minutes, it's like six minutes. Still not great because you don't want to spend that, that long queuing. So I'm putting tank counter swapping here and the tank design we'll get to is a separate issue. As I said, there was always been a tank probably in Overwatch in just different flavors. So the current flavor is tank counter swapping, which is that everybody knows if you played Overwatch currently, it is miserable when you play tank, the enemy team, not just the enemy tank. It started with just the enemy tank, but now it's everybody. It's going to switch to the thing that hard counters you. You're going to run back and spawn. And unfortunately, as long as there is one tank, it will probably forever be the case that some tanks in particular will always suffer, right? Like Sigma, harder to counter pick, possible, but harder than a Winston, right? Winston, much simpler to counter pick. So some tanks will always suffer. Any tank player will suffer because people know that the one tank has the most responsibility. They have theoretically the most power in controlling the game. And so if you can focus them down and counter swap your comp to get to them, you're probably going to win. So that's a big problem. And fundamental, I think, to 5v5 roll queue, like, may not change. Sanded down games. What I put down is this, is, this is a sanded down version of the game. And this has been true of every subsequent change after the hero limits. So 6v6 open queue was the most diverse and fresh game you could get. 222 was a lesser but more sane version. So again, when you bring the chaos down, you get generally more stable games, but the stability is a bit boring too. You don't get those cool, awesome games, but you don't get the wild shit games as much. You get more regularly balanced games. So 5v5 is a sanded down version of Overwatch. Now, because of what we talked about with tank counter swapping, it is a lot easier to get stomped one way or the other, I think. I mean, I will. I want to caveat this because as I said, if you have the two tanks badly matched up, you're going to get a stomp as well. But I do think the games feel more one-sided in Overwatch 2 because sometimes it just feels like there's nothing you can do to swing the outcome when when the matchmaker feels like it's a big matchmaker diff. And I don't know exactly why. It Maybe it's just because, like I said, the tank can be isolated. But even sometimes it's not just the tank's fault. Sometimes just the supports are not the right pick and you kind of get stomped a lot. So I don't know exactly, I can't put my finger on the pulse of exactly what is the cause, but it does happen and I think that's a fair anecdotal observance from people. And then tank design. What I mean by this is we had the problem in 6v6 with you couldn't make tanks that mitigate. We've also got a problem now in 5v5 where if one tank can't deal with certain things, it's often problematic. So we see this with most prominently Mauga and Roadhog, right? Tanks who cannot eat like block an anti-nade are in this perpetual problem of either they're balanced so strongly that they should be viable even when anti-nade is in the game or we nerf Ana to the ground or they're just shit. It's a bit of a lose-lose in that respect. Like there's no, none of those are satisfying outcome. If they're OP with, that, with Ana, then they're unkillable when Ana isn't being played or when Ana is bad, which we saw in the Hog rework. After he got reworked, he was fucking unkillable and kind of still is. It's just that he's not the most value right now, but he's still kind of unkillable in many ways, especially when Ana's not being played. And then when he's not being, when he's worse, he's just unpickable. Because if you're running him and they run Ana, you're just completely trolling. You also don't, like, yes, we could, you could say maybe you hate Ana. Maybe you're like, fine, fuck Ana and nerf Ana. It creates a future problem down the line because you're going to want to create other characters who could maybe do something like anti-nade, not the same thing, but an ability that gets thrown in the direction of a tank that if not mitigated, screws them over. Discord is sort of a version of this, except no tanks really mitigated other than like a Zarya. So all of these are problems with 5v5. And if there's anything else you want to mention, mention before I start talking about the pros of these particular formats. So again, off the top of my head, these are the things I can think of. I'm sure other ideas, other points can be made. But here are the benefits of 5v5 roll queue. Number one, the queue times are better than 6v6. Again, queue times are still a thing, but they're a lot better than 66 purely because we need one less tank. And on top of that, you know, we've gone free to play. So th that's another benefit that, you know, is unfortunately not 6v6's fault, but we've gone free to play. So we have like a, a bigger player base in general. And it, it the disparity doesn't seem as bad. Like obviously now with one tank and two DPS and two supports, it feels a little bit more even in terms of how many people want to play each of those. Tank is still the least, but it's a little bit more even, especially between DPS and support. 
and also depending on the meta state and who's strong. We've seen supports be, you know, the most picked role by far. Less players equals quicker games. It's another just benefit. It's not just that you've removed five, like one tank, but going 10 players in the lobby instead of 12, again, just quicker, better in terms of matchmaking. And these are not, again, I said this on the podcast, but these are not necessarily sexy solutions. They're not like a, a sexy problem to talk about. Like, oh man, queue times are faster, but it is huge. Now, a more freedom for DPS and support. So undoubtedly, DPS and support players can do a lot more when there's one less tank to shut them down. This is, again, one of the big appeals of 5v5 was that, as I mentioned, when two tanks were stacked on top of each other, doing shit, you were often just completely powerless as a DPS or a support to do anything. The biggest playmaking you can do is to heal your tank up. And this is why we saw so many accusations of heal botting. And we saw when we went to 5v5, support players were complaining and other people said, you guys just have not adapted. And I think, I think there was truth in it. I think the support player base when we started Overwatch 2 was much more used to a overly safe game where they could sit behind shields or just tank protection and just heal ball. R largely just heal ball. Like, the idea, you guys, I, I cannot even describe to you guys the idea of like a BAP doing as much damage as like anyone else in the lobby was not widely accepted as a thing in, in, in Overwatch 1, right? In 6v6, you wouldn't be getting these like awkward style DPS, you know, DPS, 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 damage, 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 support gameplay, because it just wasn't even available to you. Like, you can't even get that much damage done through two shields or even just a bubble and another bubble just wasn't a thing you could do and same for dps players now that you can like duel things more easily you don't have like an off tank whose job it is to shut you down there's a lot more freedom to do things so in particular dps board players have seen a lot more flexibility for what they can do in the game now 5v5 the more popular game for but what i mean by that is more games are 5v5 than 6v6 and again do not underestimate the benefit the fringe benefit that that has right there's the fringe benefits of like esports becomes easier if you're a collegiate team most of them only have a setup for five pcs and their programs are geared around five players so like it's a better path to pro for players who are collegiate any sort of pro venue is going to have like the setup for a 5v5 players are more used to like new players who are, you want to poach players from valorant or league or dota whatever they're used to 5v5 it, it shouldn't be underestimated that it's just like a comfort thing that players are like oh okay it's the same that i'm used to the same thing that i'm used to less visual clutter now, recently, we've seen Malga Symmetra metas with tremendous amounts of visual clutter, but it definitely has less visual clutter still compared, like just naturally, because you have one less player on each side and tanks often are the ones with the big shields that are the ones making the visual clutter. So that's fairly straightforward. Also easier to process, not just visual clutter in terms of a viewing experience, but for the player to process, you know, a total of nine other players rather than 11 other players does make a difference, is potentially less overwhelming to get into and finally more stable games so when we went from open queue to roll queue 6v6 and this will come through come through in the benefits of 6v6 open queue section we sanitized the game a lot right quick play became bearable and again i will elaborate on that in a second but for the same way 5v5 stabilized the game a lot right like you will get more games that are winnable and playable than when 6v6 open queue you will get even when your tank is being hard countered, it's much more likely that you might win than when your tank was picking the wrong two tanks and they have the right two tanks. So there's that stability that like more players in the lobby have more agency. As I said, with, with the DPS players and the support players having more agency to win their own games, that also means that the game isn't so heavily dependent on what comp you're running. That's actually another benefit. It's not that compositions don't matter in Overwatch 2. They definitely do, but less so than in role q 6v6 where often entire like games and meta states were just if you're not running the right comp you lose like let's say you're even running double shield right both of you are running double shield sigma or risa but one team is running lucio mora or mercy mora and the other team is running like bap zen you're just gonna lose just off of that probably these kind of things happen less in Overwatch 2 and so that is a benefit of the 5v5 okay so these are these are things i can think of at the top of my head if you have any other pros i'm sure many of you 6v6 rooters will have points you want to make and if you're watching this in a youtube video feel free to drop them in the comments if i miss anything apologies we're seven hours deep into the stream so i may forget things so the first benefit that people always talk about is that synergies were fun two tanks synergizing when done correctly 
was very fun. We again, we have discussed how it was infrequent that they were synergizing well, but when they were doing it, it was a lot of fun. And it was much more the Overwatch that people remember and fell in love with, right? The like, oh, I bubbled my Ryan and he went in and he did this, that, that. That was part of the core memories of Overwatch. So the synergies were fun. The complexity of the game was high, right? Simply put, more combinations of things you could pick equals more complex executions. Having to synergize with certain, you know, styles. You know, using your bubble on your on your Winston at the right time was a skill that required knowledge of that. So the complexity was higher, which is a, is a potential con too, because again, simpler game, easier to get into. But at its peak, it was a it was a tougher game, right? Like it was harder to know what to do, and therefore it made it more challenging and more rewarding. More comps is the better way of putting this. There's like there was more type of comps you could run. The pro like now you have more individual things that you could pick. Back then there was like more compositions you could try and add counter swapping less problematic so again we know this is a big problem and in overwatch 1 we actually had the opposite problem in some respects and i think frito was trying to allude to this last time we discussed this on the podcast counter swapping almost didn't matter when the meta comp was figured out you basically never wanted to pick anything else you just picked the meta comp and ran it all the time you didn't care that there was like the comp wasn't theoretically good against high ground comps or on high ground you just played the, the meta thing and you ran it everywhere you kind of already did the counter swapping based on the meta. So one really comical thing that you guys may not have seen if you've only come into watch post or watch two. At the pro level, there was this comical dance where teams would just sit and spawn at the start of a game and wait to see what the enemy team was running. So let's say you're playing attack on, on Eichenwald. You just sit and spawn on attack. And you wait, you send your Sombra out. She runs in and scouts and then translocates back and tells you what they were running. And knowing what they were running, you just switch to whatever comp you want. And that's it. You run the, you run that comp. Because you didn't need to really think about what you were going to counter swap to in the middle of the game. You just knew that there was like two to three comps that were viable at any point in time. You just knew that there were two to three comps you could run at any time. If they're running A, I'll run B. Maybe they'll mirror us on B or they'll try and run C, but we don't care. So I want to add as well, I keep making this point more complex. There were more comps possible, but I would also say less were viable. In 5v5, we... More comps are meta at any one point in time, I would say. But you must caveat and say part of that is that they balance 6v6 less than 5v5. I have to acknowledge that 6v6 never got the fairest of shots in how it was balanced. So maybe they could have fixed 6v6 to be more diverse too. But in terms of what was happening at the time, this is what was happening at the time. Very few comps were realistically viable at any given point in time. I put more unique question mark. In that, while I said that most games are 5v5, potentially 6v6 is also what stands Overwatch apart. And the synergies and the 12 players is what made Overwatch different to the other games. So maybe you you actually appeal to the people who didn't like the 5v5 format. They like 6v6 games. So, here's the benefits. The benefits of 6v6 open queue. So it's kind of like, you could almost draw a little graph, and maybe we will draw a little graph of like, a scale here of like all the things that are applicable for 5v5 like for 6v6 versus 5v5 become even more exponential in open queue so if 5v5 has less synergies than 6v6 open queue 6v6 has even more synergies if you thought just running ryan zarya was fun how about running ryan zarya diva or whatever right like the all those like options and complexities are exponential so you have even more chance to combine heroes that you wouldn't normally combine right and there's the downsides as we discussed with goats, where that's unfun. But there's also the plus sides, like hey, it's fun to run three tanks together and see how they, you know. There was a point where there were people running four tanks before goats when Mora had released. People were running what was called the slambulance, four tanks and two supports. That was fun too, you know, within reason. Like obviously you keep abusing that, and people aren't going to enjoy it, but that's fun. Complexity of the game higher again, so even more so than roll queue the complexity of the game is higher but it's also simpler so the ends of it again the ends of it are wider to get in you don't need to think about anything you just pick a hero and go right you don't at at the bronze level who even fucking knew what goats was who gave a shit what goats was like you just play you just load in play whatever hero you want as long as you're not picking someone thing someone else has already picked it doesn't really matter if you're synergizing or not but at the same time you could also get really complex comps and the interactions are like who's swapping where you could swap onto anything at any point in time so the complexity is higher and it also leads to the point about flexing stronger right so currently let's say you're playing dps or let's say you're playing tank 
they run Roadhog. You've been running, let's say, Reinhardt, right? But the enemy team has now counterpicked you out of Reinhardt. You know that realistically what you need is an Ana. They have an Ana, and so if you mirror Roadhog, you're going to lose the mirror. You need an Ana on your team, but your team won't do it because they don't have an Ana player or refusing to switch to Ana. And you know this is the answer. Currently, you're locked in. You're like, no, I'm on tank, so I cannot change my role in the middle of the game. Whereas in open queue, in theory, you were only one swap away from finding the answer to the game. The detractors will say, that wasn't always the case. There wasn't always the case that there was one swap that could make things work. But in theory, you could be like, I think what we need right now, I know I am playing Reinhardt, but what we need is a Sombra. So I will switch to Sombra. And that option meant that if you were a flex player, if you were someone who understood the game, the whole roster was available to you to figure out an answer or to just be like, I think this will let us win more. Even if you're maybe not struggling, you're just like, I think this is even better. And it again leads into the idea of near infinite options, right? There was, you know, literally no limit to what you guys could come up with, especially now when we have even more heroes. Back then we started with like 17, I want to say, or something like that. So we have so many more options. And so combine them all, you know, it's hard to even know if people would be able to figure out the quote unquote meta comp at any point in time, unless there was something massively abusive. That's something that's like massively like goats. Outside of that, people could probably theory craft. And it meant that you were more free to theory craft in your games. So for example, when goats was meta at the pro level, it wasn't really dominant at the rank level because people, it actually required a lot of coordination to play. People didn't have that in rank. So you could quite frequently beat something like a tank heavy or a goats comp by running like one ball, one mercy, four DPS, right? Like that was a thing people ran. And I think actually of all the, Mer every time I speak to mercy players, almost all of them say that that was the most fun they ever had was playing mercy in those matches when it was like four DPS and a ball. And so you're flying around everywhere. Everyone's kind of taking off angles. Everyone's doing their own thing, trying to pull the enemy team apart. Again, if we if we go on that spectrum of 5v5 sanded down, 6v6 open, row queue, row queue sanded down, open queue even further. So the, the, the highs were even higher and the lows were even lower. At its absolute peak, nothing beats 6v6 open queue, but nothing is quite as bad as going on Anubis attack and having five DPS and you're like, well, what the fuck do I pick to make this work? And you did get games like that, right? You did get games where people were like, I don't, I'm not going to swap. It's like this. This is what I mean when I said that ultimately it's a question of what do you prefer? Not necessarily what is better. Do you prefer a game that at its peak is more enjoyable? Like when you, when it gets going right, you're just like, this is, and it, that's what Overwatch was. That's why Overwatch was so popular. And I believe that's why people, like, I, if I was to now, I've tried to be objective until this point, but if I was to now try and inject my own personal opinions and biases, which obviously I can't escape even before, but now I'm being open about it, nothing beats 6v6 open queue. Because at the time, there was no game like it, and there's never been any game since, and I think the people who got in then are still hooked. They still have not found a game that hit those same highs as, like, those moments that came when, again, there there are factors that must be considered, like people didn't know the game as well, so you could get away with a lot more. I'm sure people would have figured it out, even if we remained open queue, made it so f figured out and boring. But it's also a lot harder to do that when you have 40 heroes. If you have 40 heroes, it's going to be harder and harder every time a new hero gets added in to find a way to like, this is the optimal only way to play the game. Apart from the, the three tank synergy, which we'll, we'll, it's a big elephant in the room that I am ignoring. But I think we've talked about it a lot that like that's that was what broke the game. But in theory, if that was made balanceable, as 6v6, you know, champions will maintain it is balanceable. The game could never be figured out. Like you'd never be able to figure out the game because you could always figure out. Actually, you never even thought of combining Venture with Life Weaver with XYZ, right? Like you never even thought about it. Rank measurement easier. This is a point we haven't covered yet, which is that, as I said earlier, because you only had the one rank, it's actually pretty simple what you're measuring in your player's capability. Can you win games of Overwatch? That is it. That is all you need to measure. And there's actually a simplicity, like a beauty in the simplicity of that. Because right now, 
we have struggled many times to figure out a comp system that works to accurately measure your ability to play tank or DPS or support. But there's so many problems because what if you're a Kiriko one trick in Kiriko season, in Kiriko's meta? You're gonna climb and then oops, Kiriko got nerfed and now Kiriko's terrible hero. Well, looks like you're in the dumpster. And how do we measure that? And how do we measure you being uh, a Moira OTP and now you have a game with another Moira OTP? Oops, looks like you lose. Uh, and what about being a Reinhardt OTP on a high ground base map versus a low ground base map? Like, there are so many, this may be part of the reason why, as we discussed in the cons of 5v5, stomps are more of a thing in 5v5. Partly, maybe this is why, because it's hard to really account for all these variables. But when you just have the one rank measurement, it's simply a case of like, are you able to navigate a game of Overwatch to victory? Yes or no? Every tool is in your disposal. Can you figure out whatever the, it is that makes you win this game? And so, yeah, it's a lot more straightforward. That's all you need to measure. Is this guy Grandmaster winning Overwatch or not? Yes or no? And you could still OTP, but over time your OTPing is, is being ironed out, right? Because if your OTPing is like, costing people over and over, you're gonna lose, but also people have more chance to uh, flex to your OTPing. If you're again, let's say you queue up on DPS, you're Reinhardt OTP. And you're like, shit, actually I'm a pretty good Lucio, but I'm stuck on DPS, I can't switch. Whereas in open queue, you'd be like, well, I can, fine, I, I wanted to play DPS, but hey, I can pay Lucio for this guy to make this work. So let me make this Reinhardt's, you know, let me make it work with this guy. And no queue time. So that's another bullet point here. No queue times. Well, relatively, right? But all you need to do is find 10 or 12 platinum players. We have a game. Much simpler and honestly worth almost highlighting. I won't do it because it would be unfair and biased compared to the other things. This alone is such a big point. I cannot state, guys, what having no queue times is as a benefit when you're trying to convince people to play your game. So that's the benefits of 66 Open Queue. If you got any other points you want to make, make them now before I head over to the potential 5v5 Open Queue. 66 is a slim possibility, but Open Queue will never be the mode of choice ever again. I don't think either of those statements are true. I don't think you have any insight into what the developers are thinking. I have some insight into what the developers are thinking and will be willing to do. I don't think anything is off the table. Actually, I, I now feel this, that previously I was like, I don't think they'll ever go back to 66. I don't know if that's true, actually. I think they could go back to 66 if they felt it was right. Like, I think this current dev team are just so flexible about how they're going to treat the game that 6v6 is on the table. Probably not a strong possibility, but a possibility. And I definitely think open queue is on the table. I don't see why not. Like, any argument that you make that we should re-explore 6v6 can doubly be made, as I will make it, that we should re-explore open queue. I'm now going to hypothesize about the benefits of a 5v5 open queue. Now, off of gut instinct, this is what I think is the best solution, personally. But I also have not closely investigated the idea, and so I'm gonna kind of do that now. And it may be that as we do that now, I realize that there are more drawbacks than before. And I obviously have not play tested it, so even if I come up with the theory of it, it may be that in practice of play testing, it's not gonna work. Let me just address right now the it's already a thing. Because this is one that people mention as like, oh, it already exists. 5v5 open queue already exists. It does not. If you think about the criticism that people have of 5v5 balance, right? Where they're like, well, the devs never really balanced 5v5. They sort of just took a tank out, made a few reworks, which weren't really that vast, and said, here you go. That is like infinitely more true of the open queue 5v5 that we have. They basically did an even more hack job version of that, which is just like, Fine, the tanks have less health, off you go. I don't even consider that a fair or legitimate version of an open queue testing. Like, it's not even worth talking about because it's so unprepared, it's so unscrutinized, it's so unbalanced that it's not even worth discussing. And I think it would be unfair to cite that as like an illustration of what it could be. So I just want to get that out the way off the rip. And it's not the pro format? Yeah, anytime you shunt, and on top of that, as you're saying, MF pal, if you shunt any mode off to the arcade, people are not going to play it and people are not going to take it seriously. So we need to see it played. 
with any remote seriousness. That's true for any of these modes, that we, any experimenting you want to do. And this is one of the reasons why I'm not sure a 6v6 quick play hacked would be ultra effective. Is that just playing it for like two days with nostalgia tinted glasses is not playing it seriously. I, you're not gonna like, people aren't gonna hard min max 6v6 quick play hack, right? They're gonna play what they think is fun, they're gonna play the Ryan Zarya's, and then they're gonna be like, bring back 6v6, see how fun it is. In truth, nothing can be fairly d balanced or discussed until we play it for like weeks on end, right? We need to play it for like at least two weeks hardcore before we can realistically make a judgment and be like, yeah, actually it got boring. It was fun for five days, and then it got boring. Like, Two days in the Malga meta, people were like, Hey, this is fun. The first time Malga launched. People were like, Malga, so fun. And then like five days in, people were like, This is the worst thing ever. So the same applies for any quick play hacks or any experimenters in these formats. We realistically need consistent time and experimentation. And I think the reason why I am not a huge fan of putting 6 in into quick play hack, I think it will do more harm than good. I think all it will do is make people say, that 6v6 was better because they'll play it with all the nostalgia and the rose tinted glasses. And then they will demand another version of it and they'll demand it to be put into the game. But they haven't really given it a fair shot. And so it'll put the devs in an awkward situation of like, shit, we, they, they say they want this, but do they? Do they actually really want it? For a whole season or at least half a season, you should put 5v5 and 6v6 competitive ladder side by side and find out what players think is the most popular. Maybe. I think it'd have to be, it would have to be a whole season, basically. I think you'd have to have a whole season. The danger of that is you're splitting the player base and increasing everyone's queue times. Because if you do it for any less than a whole season, people are just going to play it for the two weeks and be like, oh, it was so fun. So you may, maybe it's worth that sacrifice. Maybe it's worth sacrificing and splitting queue times for one season to see if people like it or not. But still, there's going to be a bias of like, I want to play the 6v6 new thing. So it's really hard. I will say it's just really hard. I so totally sympathize with the devs. Any solution here, any big format changes are going to have to be like a big cojones, giant balls call. The devs will have to make and just be like, we're fucking putting it into the game. Like they can put a quick play hack, but at some point they have to make a big call to be like, it is the only mode seriously that is the comp mode. Yes, it'll still be available somewhere, but this is the real mode now. As I said, I'm kind of, I'm in favor of an open queue where two of each role is is like max. So you cannot have more than max two tanks or two supports. I'm adding that purely because it simplifies the balance for the devs. They don't have to worry about three supports breaking the game or three tanks breaking the game. And it, it sanitizes how much they need to balance. Because if you have to balance for a potential of three tanks or three supports on top of each other, or even three DPS in some world, that can be problematic. But if you know max it's two, it's still easier to facilitate. So that's why I'm going with that. But, you know, maybe someone wants to make an argument for full open queue. I'm not that person, but go ahead. So here's the other problems with it. Role distribution. We go back to the same problem of open queue. That you're going to have an uneven distribution of roles. Most people probably won't want to play tank. And that will allude to the bottom point there, the rush to lock heroes. So in the format that I'm just currently, it's just brainstorming. If you have to have one tank, one support, one DPS, essentially, right? Because that's how the math would work out. Will it become a case of the last guy to pick will be the first and force to play tank? And here's the thing. At some point, you will have to accept some of these cons. All these cons that we have here, right? Whether you agree with my assessment of what I think might be the best for watch, I hope what this video, this presentation will show you is that you have to accept some of these whatever mode you like the most you'll have to accept like okay i'm okay with q times if i get but in benefit i get 66 roll q or i'm accepting tank and counter swapping but i'm fine with it for 5v5 so in my solution potential yeah the roll distribution will suck and yeah there may be this whole thing where like make sure you don't pick last because you're gonna get stuck on the role that nobody wanted at the moment i think that's okay maybe if i played it and i was like wow i keep getting stuck i mean personally i wouldn't give a shit because i've always been a flex player so i would even if people were like they picked everything else and forced me to play tank i'd be fine but other people would not and i appreciate that and i must respect that some people are like i don't want that world that's okay and that maybe that is 
the case. Maybe that would suck. On top of that, as we say here, it still has the potential to be broken, right? There still is a chance that two tanks will bring those problems back, even when balanced. All the problems that came with the potential of two tanks in roll queue are applied here. Basically, the reason I'm calling this my solution is that it's kind of the middle ground of everything. In my mind, it has some of the problems of roll queue and open queue and 5v5, but it also has a lot of the best elements of 5v5 and 6v6 and open queue. So let's get to that now. Here's off the top of my head some of the reasons why I think 5v5 open queue with a 2 max limit is a potentially good solution. Uh, firstly, all the things that you missed about 6v6 are back. You can still have your tank synergy uh, and you can still have these like amazing comps that you want to play. You want to play Ram Junker Queen or you want to play like this XYZ comp. You want to try, you want to see what Ball and Hog is like with just one support. You can try it. The world is your oyster again. With the added benefit of never being so bad, right? It's like we've we've opened up the potential and maybe not as high as a 6v6 open queue, but we've pushed up the potential bad sides of it, right? Where you're at least going to get one tank and you're not going to get goats. Like, goats will never be a thing. The game can never be ultra broken, but you have flexibility. And if you're like, if you're in a game and your teammates are like, we want to run Ryan Zarya, we want to see the, the Ryan Zarya comp again. They can do that. But if you enter a game where your tanks don't want to do that or they don't want to play tank, you don't have the instant loss, right? You don't have the like, so again, if you look back to roll Q, open, roll Q222, you get your priority passing hog player, the game might just be over. In this one, you get like you get a situation where nobody really wants to play tank. One guy playing tank is not the end of the world. And here's the other benefit. In the 2-2-2 roll queue, two people are forced to play tank, right? And that means queue times. And that also means reluctant tank players priority passing, right? The ball hogs. In this one, yes, potentially one person is forced to pick tank. But if the enemy team goes two tanks and you don't have two, you are getting a benefit somewhere else. So they're running two tanks, but it comes at the cost of one DPS or one support, right? They're losing something. Unlike in 6v6 or roll lock, you don't lose anything, right? You're running Sigma's Orisa, they're running Hog Ball. The, the double shielders are not, like it doesn't cost them anything to run double shield, they're just running the better comp. In the 5v5 open queue 2 max, you at least get something somewhere because maybe the the extra dps you're bringing is going to bring that value somewhere right maybe the extra support you're bringing is going to bring that value somewhere so everything comes with a gain and a cost nothing is like mandated you're gonna have an edge on the if you're not running mirrored compositions you're gonna have something you're getting out getting getting elsewhere what you're shilling bro who the fuck am I shilling for? This is not the current version of Overwatch. I'm creating a hypothetical different version of Overwatch. And you're like, you're shilling, bro. Who the fuck am I shilling for? Your fucking bomb is she an advocate of open queue? Because that might be the person I'm shilling for. So where's I? Right, so ranked is simpler. So if you only have the one, Q one SR, it's more straightforward to measure people's actual skill of the game. Because again, we go back to the system of... Your only real skill is how good are you at winning games of Overwatch, which is ultimately the only thing we can objectively measure. We can only objectively measure, can you win games, yes or no? And it, it makes queue times disappear, relatively. You might still need 30 seconds to make, a queue ha to make a game happen, but because you only need to pull 10 diamond players, that's it. You just need to find 10 diamond players. You don't need to find 10 diamond players, 2 of whom are tanks, 4 of whom are DPS, 4 of whom are supports. Just 10 diamond players, off we go, and let them figure it out. So I, I've summarized it in the bottom as higher highs, lower lows. So yes, I do concede that there will be games where nobody wants to pick the one row. Let's say it's not even always tank, right? Let's say in some meta, nobody wants to play support, and the last guy who picks is forced to pick support. Yeah, that game will suck. I cannot deny. But unfortunately, any format or watch will have a game that fucking sucks. Like, that will happen now. When you have the Doom OTP running Doom into Orisa Sombra, like that's that guy is gonna toss your game now. The reason I advocate for this 
is that I think it brings the highs back without bringing all the lows back. I think it brings enough of the good things back from previous iterations of Overwatch. It brings flexibility, it brings comps, it brings synergies, it brings like more strategy back to Overwatch while only bringing some of the bad things back and not all the bad things. So we lose the queue time problem. We lose the like nobody's running tank because everyone's running DPS. We lose the, the threat of goats. So I think it may be the best compromise for all involved, for all parties. And in truth, you you know you found a good compromise when everyone is a little bit mad and a little bit happy, right? It's like the 6v6 two-thirds will be a little bit mad. The 5v5 role queuers will be a little bit mad. But they'll be less mad than in each other's versions of the game, right? Like, it's kind of like a little bit of everything. And unfortunately, this will remain a theory craft because I don't know how we can ever test this or any other idea. It's just a theory craft that I have. But as I alluded to earlier, any format change will require months of the player base, or let's say not say let's say a month at least of the player base playing it consistently, taking it seriously. And to do that, you know, Blizzard would have to make a big call on it. Rainbow Six Siege listened to only the pro player base and the balancing of that game got way less fun and became a heavily defender side game. Well, yeah, I think, again, I don't think balancing the format of the game or format decisions should be considering the pro level. Um, because this is not an eSport. Again, some people may disagree. Some people may think it's best as an eSport. I don't think Overwatch is an eSport. When I think of it, I don't think of it as an eSport. I think of it as a fun game that people want to play casually on the weekends, you know, with their friends and family. And so you may want, you you should balance the game based off of how, th how characters can be abused and how they play at the highest end. But the format ultimately must serve the average player. The format of the game must serve what works for the vast majority of players current and potential like both the people who are currently playing and the people you're hoping to attract to your game or maybe the people who used to play your game and stop playing your game it must be a, a mode with flexibility and ease of access right it must be a mode that isn't super demanding of you and it doesn't require you to sit in queues these are in my mind, these are the two most important points. It must be quick to get into, and it must not require that you know a big flowchart of like, this is what you have to do to play Overwatch. And those are two big facets of the game. I think the problem with 5v5 is the queue times, and it's the fact that you have to like, lock a role, and know a role, and know like, if you're gonna play tank, well they're gonna pick this, and I'm gonna pick that. Whereas the benefit of open queue was that it kind of allowed you to just pick whatever you want. You don't you don't have to like restrict yourself. Another thing is I haven't even mentioned this yet, but people's hero pools never work on a like they don't work on a role basis. The majority of the people do not you don't pick your heroes. I want to emphasize that if you're listening to this right now, this probably still doesn't even apply to you. You must remember the majority a vast majority of people never watch any content like any of the people who play Overwatch the vast majority of them never watch any piece of content or if they do like only the most simple piece of content and then they peace out right 50 60 million people have played Overwatch 2 you definitely don't see 50 60 million views on a video right you don't see those people all watching XYZ's guide on you know like 2 million is like the absolute l upper limit I think Flats and I both released the two most popular recent memory videos in Overwatch history. Like Flats at the launch of Overwatch 2 released a a guide on tank that got like 2 million views at the same time that my lore history of Overwatch got 2 million views. So to put into context that in a game that we know has had 60 million players play, that's the, st that's the, the data that the devs gave us, the most viewed videos for that game are at like 2 million views. So that gives you a rough idea. And yes, part of that bias is like language bias and this, that, the other. 
But what that tells you is that, you know, maybe one in 10 people are watching content. So the point I started before I went down this little path, the vast majority of people don't base their hero pools off of like what is optimal rotation for me to know as tank. Like, you know, Boger was talking the other day. He's like, well, if you want to learn tank, have like a dive tank, have like a poke tank, have like a brawl tank. The majority of people don't think like that. If you have thought like that, if you play like that, you're already in the vast exception. And already, like I said, if you're watching this stream or you're watching this as a future YouTube video, highly likely you're already taking the game far more seriously than most people do. Most people's hero pools are like, I like D.Va, I like Mercy, I like Sombra. Like, that's it. The like Cowboy Baybop trailer got 2 million views and that was huge. So most people aren't even watching official content trailers, let alone educational content or streams or whatever. Right, and you don't, remember, you don't have to play the game to watch a YouTube video. Another thing to bear in mind is that, like, you can watch my lore video on Overwatch and not have ever played Overwatch. And same for the Cowboy Bebop. Like, I may have watched the trailer for a game I've never, I'll never play. Right? Because I'm just curious. I really disagree with that. If you look at people's career profiles, 90% of players fall into one role and a hero pool tends to be two or three heroes within a role. You're making the most classic observation bias, which is that you play comp, you fucking in this Twitch chat right now, take the game seriously. All the people around you who are you're in your games also take the game to the same level, roughly seriousness that you do. And you're observation biasing the profiles that you've checked, forgetting all the, the closed profiles, forgetting all the people who never touch comp, Forgetting the people who like you'll never see in your games because they're fucking bronze and just quick play on the weekends. Like observation bias, guys. Like you have to really, really think about observation bias. Whenever you make these like anecdotal observations of like, I think most people actually really care about the esports. Observation bias. Because you're looking at the people that are like you. I'm talking about the big picture statistics of how the game is consumed by the vast audience. I'm not talking about like the people in my chat or the people that I see. I'm talking about like the behavior of people who consume games. And honestly, I think I'm open to loads of different versions of Watch. Like I said, I would be very down to see a draft phase. I think Sam and others could make a 6v6 work. Again, I think I think here's what I think the best thing the devs can do is. I think they can do Towards the end of Watch 1, they started to do these creator patches at creator tournaments. And they, th that really showed us some fun ideas. And some ideas that we maybe don't like. Right? Like, I know Lemon Kiwi really wanted to come up with a version of Overwatch where tanks didn't have a lot of bath didn't have a lot of damage. And people just didn't like that. They were like, oh, I don't, I don't think this is fun. And that's a valuable lesson for the developers to know. It's like, okay, people don't like it when the tanks can't kill anything when they're just damage sponges. So I feel like, and here's the other benefit of making a creator patch is that you don't have to like own it as the developers. You don't have to be like, we thought this was a good idea and you guys said we're clowns. Like if you put up an idea, if a creator comes up with an idea and it's shit, you can just say it was that guy's fault. It was that creator, he's clueless, blame him. But one thing they did wrong with that is that they gave each role to a different creator. They need to give like, a group of creators, the whole reins of the of the whole patch. Or even one creator, although that's a lot of responsibility to put on one creator. But like, get like three creators, you know, and be like, hey, come up with a cohesive vision of a version of Overwatch. It could be 6v6, it could be open queue, it could be 5v5 open queue with two locks. We'll make it happen in the game. And you guys will host a tournament. And that way, it's like the best of both worlds again. That's kind of, I guess I'm always looking for the compromise. But you get to see people try it and potentially sweat sweat it out as well without everyone being like, oh my god, the devs are so stupid, they did this quick play hacked and it's so dumb and bad and they balanced this wrong.